Uh, it's the emotional roller coaster that the whole thing took us on, the, re the real emotions of the actual story, and the emotions that Jayla and Tim and all the other actors brought to the, from Andrew's script in, onto the screen, but then there's also the kind of badass thing that we love, which is chasing real wildfires, which was a four year process of chasing every single one that we could, that we heard about. So that was, that's the other technical cool element, but there's other stuff that's more important for q &A. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, Chile, just maybe you, you can speak to uh, conversations you had with Andrew and maybe the producers as well about uh, how this material would be handled, you know, once it left the page and became uh, the stuff kind of conveyed by flesh and blood people. Oddly, we didn't discuss that specifically. My initial conversation was with Josh. Um, I'm a part of the Women in Film and Television Mentorship Program, and Jordana was a mentee of mine who is related. And she had said, I think there's this movie that might interest you if I can put you in touch. And we had spoke, I read it, and then um, we spoke, and it didn't seem like the timing was going to work, unfortunately. Um, but as, honestly, as soon as I read it, I'd seen Violent, uh, and as a part of the Leo's adjudicating a few years prior, and was blown away by just the, the cinematic quality of it alone, and thought, listen, if these guys made that, <laughs> uh, sign me up. Um, it ended up coming back around a few months later. My understanding is that it was a challenge to get people to say yes because of the content. I wasn't privy to those conversations. However, I can take credit for Tim being in this movie. <laughs> and you should. Well, you I mean, it's Tim's movie, to be fair. But he and I share a manager. And when it came back around and we didn't yet have it, they didn't yet have a stand, um, I called my manager. I was like, I think you should call Tim. And he was like, I'm already thinking about it. Tim and I had worked together on a show for years, but never actually had scenes together. So, and we were very good friends. And the notion of being able to have scenes with him, I was salivating over. And then this material was like, well, <laughs> I knew he'd kill. Um, yeah. And then I said yes, and four days later, we were in Kelowna. So not a lot of time to have any second thoughts, to be completely honest. Yeah, it was fast. And I know you've talked about this a little bit, but I imagine there must have been almost an arc for yourself of uh, maybe a home, hometown boy returns to make a movie you know, where he grew up and then the community started to understand exactly the film you were, you were telling you. Yeah, it was kind of shattered. The mood, yeah. mood shifted very quickly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I was actually the Peachland ambassador in 2008, so, <laughs> so returning was like everyone, the Peachland view was writing about it, like prolific Peachland ambassador, director returns, and then <laughs> Things just got quiet after a certain point. Um, we had a conversation with the district of Peachland and they were like, oh, you know, oh, it, was, it was actually kind of a, that was a, that was a moment. We were talking with the district about using the, the fire trucks and, and the, you know, the uniforms and everything. And the, I don't, I don't say who it was, somebody in the, in the town, in the higher up position, she said, you, you can't use the name she Peachland. <laughs> you can't use the name Peachland, and uh, you know your experience may have been uh, positive with this person, but we have a different opinion. And um, and I I was kind of a, like I got emotional in the whole meeting, and so I really felt like I laid myself on the line. And then um, it was just kind of like you're not you're not going to do this. And then we went back and I talked to Amber. I was just like, so we can't use the name Peachland, and Amber's like, that's bullshit. You can't. Yeah, they don't, have, they don't have a legal obligation to do that. <laughs> that was very badass. <laughs> well, we, yeah, we couldn't use district Peachland, right. but nobody owns Peachland. It happened in Peachland. I mean, that, it happened. Yeah, that story happened. <laughs> uh, do we have questions out here in the audience? Don't be shy. There's a hand right there. And actually, there's a microphone up here, but she's going the wrong direction. Uh, so, you, you, sir, if you ask your question, I will repeat it. It's like the breakfast scene. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that was amazing, by the way. That was a
the question was about the long shots of nature, the sublime qualities of it, and if you drew from film theory to, uh, to inspire the compositions of the film. Um, I think most of it was just, like Kane was saying, chasing these fires, and we kind of immerse ourselves in that whole world, and the interesting thing about forest fires is they're, it's kind of slow, and it's kind of boring in a way. Like, you just kind of sit and watch it, and it doesn't, not a lot happens, really. So we kind of, we're just in these places, and we're just watching the fire, and it's kind of meditative in a way where you just kind of let it all kind of soak in. So I think that inspired a lot of those long kind of moments where you're just kind of observing the world. So we wanted to frame it in ways where you could just kind of look around and take it in. Um, but yeah, I think we, we had a lot of inspiration and kind of influences early on from like Steven Spielberg and stuff. And that stuff didn't really make it, you know, very far, but it's a starting point. And then at a point you kind of just let the story inform all those decisions. So that's kind of where we ended up. tell the story about so we're at the house and standing and sort of getting setting up for something and all of a sudden six of you go ripping by they're like there's a fire and they just all launch out into the van and take off the other well yeah we were prepared we every time there was a fire we had a protocol so it was like get the van as quickly as possible bring the van bring the previa so if we can get some shots with it and the fire that's amazing and it was crazy yeah it was day 12 we were all shooting down at the house, and we had amassed a, a large amount of footage of forest fires from years previous. And as we were shooting, somebody's like, see, see smoke. And, and everybody all of a sudden just packs up, brings everything up to the hill in, in Peachland, and in the course of like an hour, and this is how it goes, in the course of an hour, the, the fire grew to this huge point, and it, it just filled the sky, the smoke filled the sky. And then, you know, we were for, for days after, we were filming at the house with this huge plume of smoke and the smoke around us, um, which I think for any other film, it would have meant that we would have to like, call it a day because it, it, the lighting is so different. The, the way that the, the land looks is totally different. And, uh, but for us, it was like, it was good. <laughs> yeah, and then Tim and the fire in the same shot. I mean, that was like the original concept when we first started talking about it, it's like, how can you get an actor for two months and they're just kind of on call and we're going to these fires together? And then very quickly, that became logistically impossible if we were trying to get it like a notable actor. And then uh, as luck and horrible luck would have it, it, this is the two sides of the same coin kind of thing. Um, the fire st started when we were filming, so we got shots with Tim and the fire, which is crazy. Well, it's what I'm hearing here, you, you know, you made Violent for, you said, about you know, $30,000 in hard cash. Um, and this was a, a go from a million dollar budget. Yeah, apparently. Yeah. But, but you still were able, oh dear, you might owe, owe her more money now. Um, but, uh, I should have never said it. Uh, but, but obviously it was important to you to kind of maintain that, uh, that agility and uh, adaptability that you brought to the very DIY uh, Violent be, you know, agile, be able to move to the next scenes you needed to shoot, and uh, that, that, uh, the takeaways from Violent has been very valuable to you in terms of how your team wanted to just approach filmmaking as a, as a practice. Totally, yeah, that was, that was the, the philosophy the whole time, is, is how can we kind of uh, take apart the structures of traditional filmmaking, and how can we scale this down and make it uh, an experience for the actors that feels real and um, go to locations that, one, well, this thing is that we were, I, I grew up in Peachland, so we'd be suggesting locations, kind of like secret locations. Um, and yeah, so I, I think that this sort of like, we were definitely stuck, we were, no, not stuck, but we were in the middle of two worlds, like the violent world, which is just a six person crew, and this, the sort of like bigger budget movie making, which is a bigger crew, and, and you know. So yeah, it was, we definitely carried, carried that forward, especially with, the, the days that we were going up to the fire and being you know, told to go back. Go back, go back, go back. One more minute, one more minute, one more shot. Uh, do we have more questions up here? Uh, there's one on the far right hand side. And the mic is headed towards you. Hello, um, great film, you guys, it was so beautiful. Um, 
My question is, in terms of like real time with this story, what did this exposure of this person happen alongside the fires, or was the choice to showcase this personal tragedy alongside of this natural disaster more thematic that you guys kind of put together after the fact? Because it was very effective. Thank you. Um... He did follow forest fires as a reporter, but no, the, we did put kind of like two summers together. One summer previous was the big fire in Peachland, I think it was in 2012 or 2015 or whatever. The next year was when the charges were, were uh, announced. And so um, we combined the two summers of his life. Cool. There's a question great in the middle aisle here. Mike finds it's great to you. Yeah, thanks. I really enjoyed the empathy factor that you speak of. Um, I think it was an amazing performance by Tim, absolutely stunning. And uh, I wonder if you could speak to the psychology of it a little bit. What I'm curious about in particular is in the development process, did you ever uh, consider delving more into his past and his history? I felt like there were allusions to that with the amazing score that was there. I had these sort of reminiscent things going on. I don't know if anyone else did. It was very kind of holy and, and choral. Uh, I would love to hear about the psychology of that. And, and again, I love the empathy factor. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, go ahead. Do you want me to take a stab at that? Take a stab. <laughs> All right, just so I don't seem like I'm rip that they dragged in off the street <laughs> to participate in this. Um, I work in this area. I've had clients in the past with pedophilia OCD, and I also have clients that have pedophilia, not the OCD version. Um, so Andrew originally got in touch with me a few years ago to ask a few questions about how this would present to make sure that the picture that they were giving was an accurate one. So to the point about empathy, um, Andrew came to me already with this empathy. Um, and I think probably that was in part because of your personal experience, knowing this person, but he wanted to make sure to get this right and to present this in a way that didn't come across as judgmental it was fair, it was accurate, it still left some ambiguity, um, but nonetheless still kind of captured the picture correctly. Now, to your point about empathy, um, this is often a challenge, and I think this was in part the purpose of the film, if I understand correctly based on our past conversations, was to present this thing that oftentimes uh, would bump up against people's strongly held beliefs. Um, now, this is interesting because it was pedophilia OCD, so it wasn't actually pedophilia the sexual preference, which is probably a little bit more palatable, and I think from an empathy point of view, that's a little bit easier for the audience in general. Um, but nonetheless, the content was described there, and I got the sense, and maybe I'm wrong on this, maybe I'm right, that for some people this probably was pretty challenging to try to think about this guy in an empathetic way, despite the fact he participated in this thing that could be seen potentially as harmful. Um, so, I think the film, at least from my point of view, did a really good job of capturing the empathy that one would need to try to understand what this experience would be like, um, and hopefully without too much judgment, despite the fact there probably still is some there. I don't have anything to add. <laughs> He's a teacher, it's like... Uh, there's a question up on this side. There's no longer a question that side, there's one in the middle. Though. Hi, um, so I just wanted to say that I've been following the film since you um, announced that it was coming. Like I was just pressing the refresh button every time you <laughs> updated the uh, production journal. Um, and so it, I just wanted to say that it's uh, really cool to be a uh, part of this moment. And uh, my question is, uh, was there a scene that you felt like um, it held the most amount of stakes? Like, um, was there a scene, like a particular moment where um, I just felt like you really needed to get it right? Um, that's a great question, and thank you. Thank you for what you said. The, the, the hard thing about making the film was that it was pretty much every scene was make or break. I don't know if you remember, but it was just sort of like, 
oh, okay, so now we're gonna now we're gonna talk about it. Okay, wow. Okay, now we have to get into this headspace that's uh, really difficult. Um, and it was pretty much scene after scene of trying to break new ground with what the characters were discovering or explaining. Um, yeah, all those all the scenes between you and Tim were just like. You made my job really easy. It was like, I, I gave you the material, but then I just pretty much I sat back. <laughs> so that's a testament, that's a testament to, to their, their craft, for sure. Uh, but yeah, every scene, I'd say, between, between them was, it, it, we couldn't get it wrong, otherwise everything would fall apart, because it was, each scene was like this turning point for the characters. You also had, um, we also had the luxury of because we were away from home, we were able to squeeze in rehearsal whenever possible for a lot of those scenes, which there are a lot of people in the industry in this room, and you know what a privilege <laughs> and a luxury it is to have rehearsal. And anyone who's making a movie, provide rehearsal time. It will pay off, I promise you. So we did have that, which I think really helped. And then we already had some relationships, so. And then you were really good, so. <laughs> There's uh, another thing in the back. Kind of like second row for that, yeah. First off, congratulations to you, Andrew, and the whole team for this film and having a culminate in this moment that you get. Um, you mentioned, there was a mention of Violet and someone touched on uh, the sound design. With the previous film, it was um, connected very much so with the music. And there was a companion album with your band. What were the thoughts in the beginning of pre-production and with the writing group and the director of photography? I'm going to include almost everyone here. Um, just sharing thoughts on what you wanted this to look like and how integrated you wanted the sound to be in this instance, because uh, I'm not sure what the plans are for soundtrack or um, score release for this one, but yeah. um, it, it hit almost, it, it was very impactful, like what, so I'm just curious some of the thoughts that went on behind this. The raptors were shaking. I don't know if you heard that. That was awesome. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Certain notes. Wow. Yeah, that was awesome. Yeah. Um, well, um, I think that uh, our team has a certain... I'm just going to try to go right down the barrel. I'm not building up the team. or I'm just going right down the barrel on your question. Um, I think our team is special in the way that we are involved from the beginning the core elements of the post and actual production as well as like pre-production, all those core team members are involved the whole way along. And so I think when it comes to like ideas for shots or ideas for score, ideas for like some crazy scene we could throw in or Andrew's having some thoughts about a dialogue or whatever, I would say that we're all sort of holding hands all the way through. So with Violent, I think in a lot of ways you could look at that movie as a as a kind of grand improvisation. And this, though this the script was a lot more planned than violent, I would say when when it came to the shots as we said about the fire, like just chasing the fire, the fact that the van that Stan has was also the production vehicle just in case we had to like <laughs> take the production vehicle and like also it had to be a usable shot, you know, like. We had everything planned so that improvisation could be a key element in how we put the film together. As well, when we went into post, we just rented a house with a large connected room and we set up the soundtrack side, and we set up the editing side, and we just passed that back and forth until the film was done. So they were just going at the same time, at the same rate. You know, we call it the devil's nectar when you're like kind of bored and you need to go and like get hyped on what the other dudes are doing. So you're just like, 
you got to play that for me, you know? And then like everybody's getting soaked over here and then everybody comes over here. I don't know, it's just, I would say that the, because we come from a music background first, well, because we come from a music and film background at the same time, you know, I think there's always a focus on both. I'm long-winded now, but anyway. No, that's yeah. good. <laughs> so it says you good. Yeah, great job. Good, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We have a question right here. What's the rules behind the mic? Um, I was just curious if there's any significance with the serenity prayer that um, Sam was saying a bunch of times. I know that's like kind of a 12 step. Uh, I just wondered if there's any like uh, thought behind that. Yeah, so that uh, serenity prayer is like what the family, what the man the, who the movie is based on, he has it written in his kitchen as a reminder to himself. Um, and I, yeah, I would imagine that there's probably some ties to um, some program like that, but I think it was became a mantra for how the family would deal with the, the community turning on them. And, you know, some things you can control, some things you can't control, and the, the goal is to know what the, what the difference is. Um, originally, the title was uh, I'm Not a Bad Person. I was just curious as to why the change, change in the title. Maybe Josh can answer that or Andrew? Good question. Uh, honestly, it was our sales agent who picked up the film. Um, in talks with lots of sales agents, they would mention the title. Just length and complexity. Um, so I think our initial reaction was we'll never be able to come up with a, a different title, but I don't know who came up with Ash, but I think unanimously everyone was like, it fits so perfectly. Yeah, and I think there's also a matter of being like, we have so many mounds to climb with this film. Like, let the hill that we die yeah. on not be what, like, it's gotta be called I'm not a bad person. Like, if a sales agent is interested in, in the film, and trying to sell the film to distributors, then it's just like, okay, great. Yeah, it's a awesome. common thing that they want to change the title. Yeah. yeah. I think this one is beautiful. Thank you. It also doesn't give as much away. Yeah. 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 More involvement. Uh, and then we have another question right on this side, yeah. Uh, hi, so I wanted to reiterate what one of the other question asters said before, which was just that following this film has been pretty cool to see it come to its fruition. I flew here from Winnipeg to see it because oh. <laughs> I had most of it friends to film, so I was like, oh my, uh, my, my question is, uh, reading Dave Preston's book, it, the trajectory is upward. It, it gets more and more positive as the book goes on. So I was wondering why you decided uh, to end it on such a harsh note, like such a heart-wrenching moment in his journey? That's an amazing question. Um, so just to sort of be clear here, the man who went through this experience uh, wrote a book and published it. It's called Truth Be Told, The Dark Side of OCD. Um, his name is Dave Preston. Um, and that's a, that's a really, really good question. My personal sort of uh, spin on it was that, like I said before, I, I didn't want to make a movie in defense of somebody's actions or justifying it. Um, and obviously there is this arc actually where the character is getting better and the relationship between him and Gail is getting better. And you see that in the contrast of what the outside world thinks of him and of them changes. Um, so I think, I, I just felt like it was important to show at the end both sides. Um, and it's, 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 it's inconvenient and it's dark and it's imperfect and that's, but this happens and to make it triumphant I think would just be disingenuous. Like it would just, it wouldn't feel right. It would, it would, it would ring false. So uh, it's, it's, there's beauty in the story, but it's a tragic story. Uh, hey, I'm speechless. Yeah. I've never seen anything like this. 
Um, I just briefly wanted to comment that I just got yeah, the music. Um, I was really curious about how, how, I guess, obviously some of the music was, like, I guess, created for this film, but also some of it was found. I noticed that there was a choir from the USSR uh, in 1986, and, and just, yeah, like, I'm definitely curious about the discovery and exploration and research process that went into finding that. And the other thing and that I also just wanted to briefly mention was I was also really um, kind of very intrigued by the role of the psychologist, even though it was a brief scene. It's like, you know, we see the legal moment of truth and exploration happening and decision, and then also. But there's this private scene that happens too, and I, I also just wanted to say that I, I was really, um, you know, it, it made me wonder a bit about what it's like being a psychologist, judging people in this situation and being almost like in that incredible position. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, right. Well, Jason, do you want to take the first? As a representative of psychologists. <laughs> Um, this scene was absolutely critical, um, from my point of view, in distinguishing between pedophilia OCD and pedophilia, and Andrew and I have talked about this, I think, early on when we started writing this script. Um, so normally, that entire process would probably take two, three, maybe four hours to get to that point, so this was the efficient version with the key information that the audience needed to know. Um, so part of your job is as psychologists, it's not that we lack judgment. Um, we still judge uh, positively, negatively, neutrally. Um, but our job is to keep that at bay and not let it interfere with the work that we're doing. Um, and to do this type of work, to work with people that are struggling with this, um, I don't think it's for everybody, that's for sure. Um, as a matter of fact, very few people do do this type of work because I think they find it a real struggle to be able to empathize and help people struggling with pedophilia OCD and pedophilia as well. Um, so it's a bit of a challenge, uh, but you, with practice it's something that you can be capable of doing. Um, when I'm sitting across from somebody that is struggling with this sort of thing, I always try to remind myself that for them this probably wasn't a choice, right? The OCD, the pedophilia, we know that it's not something people choose to experience, but we still talk about responsibility and related behavior um, such that people have to take ownership of that and realize the harm that that can potentially cause. So that's an important part of that process too, and that's where empathy can come in as well. And then with regards to the song, are you speaking about the, the choir song in particular, how we found that, or the contrast between both the composed score and the, the licensed score? Um, yeah, I was curious, how did you find this, this I guess, archive uh, yeah. choir? Yeah, so that, that song was, when, when we were first talking about the film and first writing the film, I came, I came up with this uh, kind of just playlist of, of choral music. I, I thought that the, the tone of kind of religious subtext and human voices all singing together really suited the themes of the film. And so originally we wanted to have a lot of choral stuff in, in the movie. Um, it wasn't until I think actually in the post-production process when we actually felt like we, because we, we, we moved away from that and then we revisited that concept in, in the post-production. And this song that was actually part of uh, the playlist really jumped out at us and we tried to find the, the rights to it and that was crazy. It was like some like archival Russian record label and they didn't get back to any calls or emails and there's over facts. I think you're replacing yeah. that. Yeah, it was crazy. <laughs> but it's a beautiful song. Yeah, it was worth it. And that's just proof positive that absolutely nothing was easy with this film whatsoever. Um, we are all out of time this evening, but we thank you so much for making this film and sharing it with us all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.